This morning we want to begin on the uh, 14th of our lectures. And what we're going to talk about today is the Reformation in terms of the radical reformers, or sometimes known also as the Anabaptists. In understanding this, I think a good place to begin is with the quote by Charles Spurgeon in looking back several hundred years later after the <coughs> said this, What a blessing it would have been in Luther's time if the Reformation had been carried out completely. Great as the work was, it was in some points a very superficial thing and left deadly errors untouched. I would agree wholeheartedly with Spurgeon's analysis. We're very grateful for the Reformation. They did amazing things. Martin Luther is a, uh, just a giant of history. Nevertheless, I, I would have to say that Martin Luther, Ulrich Zwingli, John Calvin, and others of the mainline reformers did not carry out their reforms completely. They did not apply the principles, for example, of sola scriptura thoroughly to their doctrines. Now, I know there are probably many within the reformed camp who would disagree with me on that, but those are just matters of disagreement. For example, honestly, I've read carefully, I've, I've researched it diligently, I, I still have a very difficult time understanding the case. Well, not understanding the case, I understand it, but agreeing with the case at all, seeing the validity of the case, of infant baptism. Yet this is something that Calvin, Luther, the English Reformation, Zwingli, all these mainline reformers still clung to. And I believe they clung to it out of a misunderstanding of the nature of the church. Um, and, and what it meant to be a member of the church, and who belongs to the church, and so forth and so on. Well, it's true that Luther did not follow through with his reforms as he might have. But other people in their very day had the heart to do it and the willingness to do it. And again, in the midst of all of this, we have to keep in mind the concept of something that might seem very strange to you, but it's the concept of the state church. This is a church that is officially sponsored and supported and cooperating with the government. And the government cooperates with the church. Also, to have a state church means, at least in its classical definition, not necessarily its more modern definition, but in its classical understanding of the state church, it means that in any, in any one area, there is only one approved church. So in other words, in England, you have the state church, the Anglican church, the Church of England. And outside the Church of England, there is no legitimate religious expression. You have the church. You don't have competing churches. You have one church. Now, in the Middle Ages and in the early days of the Reformation, it was very hard for anybody to do, as we might say, think outside the box and think that people could just worship as they please as long as they didn't cause any trouble. You see, in their thinking, having another church or denomination independent of the state-approved church was trouble. Therefore, all Christianity had to be expressed within the state church or those approved by the state church, whether that state church was Catholic or Protestant. <coughs> now, in the year 1526, Martin Luther published a translation of the Mass into common German. He said that he would have been happy with the Lutheran Latin Mass of 1523, but he saw a need for something in the language of the common people, most of whom had no idea what was going on during the Latin Mass. What Luther thought was really necessary was to have a service for those who were really saved. You see, in his mind, this service would not be held in a public place for a mixed assembly, but held privately for, quote, those who want to be Christians in earnest and profess the gospel with hand and mouth. In other words, what Luther had in mind was not a normal church service of his day. Again, get your mind around this concept. You have a village here, the village of Milstadt. Okay? How many churches are there in Milstadt? Is there a Lutheran church? Is there a Baptist church? Is there a Presbyterian church? Is there a Methodist church? No! 
There's one church. The, the state church. I mean, maybe you would say the Church of Austria, whatever. But there'd be the state church there in Milstein. And who would go to the state church? Just about everybody in the village. Why? Well, because you were um, highly questioned in society if you weren't a part of the church, if you didn't go to church. If you were a businessman, it was very bad for business. Um, you were raised to think that this was your obligation. It was just commonly what people did. You went to church. That means on any given Sunday morning, when the pastor looks out over the townspeople there in the church, what percentage of them are saved? Probably a very low percentage of them are saved. They go to church because it's their obligation to do so. What Luther thought, hey, wouldn't it be great to have a church service where you only get the people who are really saved? The people who just want to be there, not the people who feel like they have to be there. And this is how Luther thought you could have this kind of church service. He said, they should sign their names and meet alone in a house somewhere to pray, to read, to baptize, to receive the sacrament, to do other Christian works. According to this order, those who do not lead Christian lives could be known, reproved, corrected, cast out, or excommunicated, according to the rule of Christ in Matthew 18, 15-17. Here one could also solicit benevolent gifts to be willingly given and distributed to the poor, according to St. Paul's example, 2 Corinthians 9. Here there would be no need of much and elaborate singing. Here one could set out a brief and neat order for baptism and the sacraments and center everything on the word, prayer, and love. Luther said, wouldn't it be great if we could have meetings like this? But he never worked out the plan or the, the strategy for such meetings for the really sick. He said, given the current state of spirituality among the Germans, he, he considered this to be an impractical dream. And you want to know the great tragedy? Is when there were people who came up and actually had started having services like this. Outside the state church, meetings of just believers, in simplicity, sharing their things, centered on the word, prayer, and love. When those meetings did start coming up, Luther branded them as enthusiasts, fanatics, and rebels. And that same prejudice still stands in many circles to this very day. You see, Luther's strong opposition to these groups that would be outside of the official church was rooted in a Christian tradition that went at least as far back as Augustine. When Augustine was faced with the very stubborn Donatist movement in the 5th century, Augustine eventually came to the conclusion that force was necessary to keep those people from dividing the body of Christ. Again, faced with the threat of division, Augustine came up with this idea that violence was the lesser evil to heresy and division within the um, body of Christ. Therefore, he came up for this justification for persecution that I mentioned before in a previous lecture. That in other words, Jesus said in Luke chapter 14, in a parable, mind you, the master then said to the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that the house may be built. This became the standard justification throughout the Middle Ages for the use of force in religious, excuse me, in religious disputes. Now, when Martin Luther went to hiding after the Diet of Worms, translating the New Testament into German, hidden out at the Vartburg, his work was carried on in Wittenberg by a man named Karlstadt. As I said before, Karlstadt sought to implement Luther's ideas in Luther's absence. So Karlstadt started an evangelical communion service, conducting things in simplicity and in the common language, serving communion directly, and preaching justification by faith. Luther's political backer, Frederick the Wise of Saxon, became alarmed. And he asked Luther to return to Wittenberg. When Luther returned, he put down the changes that Karlstadt made, and he preached that blistering series of sermons that I had mentioned before, denouncing Karlstadt and the state changes that he made in Luther's mind. So again, this is how Luther saw Karlstadt from the Table Talk. Table Talk is a great book by Martin Luther. It's a collection of 
of things that he literally said around the dinner table. Luther had a very open home. He was always hosting guests and visitors and students in his home. And they would just talk before, during, and after dinner. And some of the students would write down some of the wonderful things that Luther said at the table. Luther and his table talk. Karlstadt opposed me merely out of ambition, for he flattered himself that on earth there was not a more learned man than he. And although in his writings he imitated me, yet he played strange tricks with my manner. He wanted to be the great man, and truly I would have willingly left the honor to him so far as it had not been against God. For I praise my God, I was never so presumptuous as to think myself wiser than another man. Now again, Luther criticized Karlstadt mainly on the grounds of pride. And I'll, I'll tell you, I have no way of addressing whether or not Andreas Karlstadt was a proud man. Maybe he was. But here's the truth. Sometimes proud, messed up people have the right ideas. And, and I have to say, in large measure, not completely, there was a violent edge to Karlstadt that was wrong, wrong, wrong. But in large measure, Karlstadt's instinct to say, let's take these principles that Luther established in the Reformation and let's carry them all the way through, that was a good impulse. But this whole conflict between Luther and Karlstadt points to a much larger issue that troubles a lot of people today. How do you implement theological truth? Karlstadt said, let's put it into practice right now. Luther said, let's wait until we can bring people into agreement and move it along slowly. In any regard, Luther was in charge of the Reformation in Germany and not Karlstadt, so he kicked <laughs> Karlstadt out and Karlstadt became what is known as an Anabaptist leader. Now, the Reformation then developed along two different lines sometimes known as the magisterial reformers and the radical reformers. The Lutherans, the Calvinists, the Anglicans were all part of the magisterial reformation. The Anabaptists scattered all over Europe were the radical reformers. And much of the difference between the magisterial reformers and the radical reformers was a difference based in a different understanding of what the church is and how it relates to society. The magisterial reformers agreed with the Roman Catholic idea that the state and the church should work together to make a Christian society. The only problem that the magisterial reformers had was not in the concept of the state and the church working together to make a Christian society. They just thought that it was the wrong church. They just said, you need to have a Protestant church working with the state together to make a Christian society. In the mind of the magisterial reformers, and the Roman Catholics for that matter, the church was part of the whole community, or the church was the whole community, I should say. There was an official state church, <coughs> and to be a citizen in good standing meant that you were a part of the church. You are therefore born into the church. I have a picture of my wife's baptism, uh, or maybe I should say her first baptism. It's a very interesting picture. My wife was born in Sweden, of course, from Swedish parents, and it's a picture of her father holding a little baby in a baptismal gown in a row of about five or six other fathers dressed in suits holding their baby in a baptismal gown and their little babies are going to be baptized. Well, the interesting thing about that is that that wasn't in a church, that was at the hospital. At that time, to be born a Swedish citizen meant that you were going to be baptized into the church of Sweden. And why mess around? They did it at the hospital. And again, this fits in perfectly with the idea of the state church. To be a citizen of good standing means you're a part of the state church and you're born into the church. Just as much as you're born into your Swedish or your American or your whatever national heritage is, you're born into that citizenship, you're also born into the church. The radical reformers had a different idea. They saw the church 
as a called out assembly, a believer's church, not a community church. And they're th thinking, you were not born into the church, you were born again into the church. And that's what the church should be. Now these people were often known as Anabaptists, which means Second Baptists. But they did not believe that they were baptizing people for a second time. For example, again, just to bring it back to the illustration of my wife, my wife was baptized as a little baby there into the Church of Sweden. But later on as a teenager, when she had really received the Lord and was on fire walking for the Lord, she wanted to be baptized. Now, in her mind, she wasn't really being baptized again. Her teenage baptism to her was actually her first baptism. She obviously had no recollection of her first baptism. All she had was a picture of it. There was nothing in her own decision, in her own will of this. So in the mind of the Anabaptists, they were not baptizing a second time. They were just baptizing the first time for real. You see, they believed that baptism was only valid for believers. But the real issue was more the nature of the church than it was baptism. How do you become a member of the church? The idea among the Anabaptists was, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're saved, you're born again, and you choose to become a part of the church. The idea of the state church people, the magisterial reformers, was that you're born into it, and your baptism is sort of your entrance ceremony into the church. This is one way that they explained it in a statement of faith. Well, let, let me just take that design. The magisterial reformers, again, worked with the magistrates, the political leaders of society, and as I showed you before in that early, they were protected by them. But the Anabaptists were different. Here we read. Baptism shall be given to all those who have learned repentance and amendment of life, and who believe truly that their sins are taken away by Christ and to all those who walk in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and wish to be buried with them in death, so that they may be resurrected with Him, and to all those who with this significance request it, that is baptism of us, and demand it for themselves. This excludes all infant baptism, the highest and chief abomination of the Pope. In this you have the foundation and testimony of the Apostles, and then they list some scriptures, and then they say, this we wish to hold simply, yet firmly, and with assurance. Now again, the idea was simply that baptism belonged to believers. I, I don't know, this, it, it's hard for me to feel that this makes much of an impact on you. Because when I say this is baptism belongs to believers, you probably yawn. You probably say, well, duh, you know, big deal. You need to understand what an absolutely revolutionary idea this was in the Reformation time. And it wasn't just a revolution among Catholics. They weren't just protesting Catholics there. They were also protesting the magisterial reformers who also practiced this and many other things. This is another thing written by Menno Simmons, a later Anabaptist leader. He says, We are not regenerated because we have been baptized but we are baptized because we have been regenerated by faith in the Word of God. Regeneration is not the result of baptism, but baptism is the result of regeneration. This indeed cannot be controverted by any man or disproved by the Scriptures. Now again, you read that, you have a tendency to say, big deal. This is what the majority of the Christian world believes, or, well, I don't know if you can say that numerically, actually. It's not what Catholics believe. It's not what mainline Protestants believe, but certainly the majority of the evangelical world in the church today believes this. And nevertheless, it was an absolute radical thing for a man to believe and to say in those days. Uh, one more on this. Menno Simmons wrote, I know that Luther teaches that faith is present in infants just as in a believing, sleeping man. To this I reply, first, that if there were such a sleeping faith in little unconscious infants, which however is nothing but human sophistry, but by the way, just stop right there. Luther's argument for baptizing babies is that there is faith in them, but you just can't see it and tell. 
There's faith in them as there would be faith in a sleeping man, right? The sleeping man can't do anything about his faith, but he still has it. He's just asleep. So, um, Simmons just says, look, that's just a rhetorical device. Those are just words. But then he says, it would notwithstanding be improper to baptize such children so long as they do not verbally confess it and show the required fruits. For we, holy, for the holy apostles did not baptize any believers while they were asleep, as we have shown in our former writings. Well, again, it's totally true. So, there came this big issue. Now, the last thing I want to get in your mind is that the only dispute between the Anabaptists, or let me put it this way, the only dispute between the radical reformers and the magisterial reformers was baptism. That was not the only dispute at all. There were many, many other fundamental differences in how they saw the world and in how they saw the church and how they saw the, living the Christian life. But baptism was the one issue that was the easiest to get a handle on. And that's why they're called Anabaptists. Now, many of the radical reformers were also social revolutionaries who wanted to change society for the good of the common man. You have to understand this, and we'll talk more about this. It'll be kind of repetitive in this particular lecture. But what you need to understand is in one way, it's almost useless to talk about the Anabaptists or the radical reformers. Because they were actually such a broad collection of people that the last thing in the world you should do is think that they were one unified group. Anabaptists or radical reformers could be anything from some of the most godly people who ever walked the face of the earth to radical kooks. Like, um, I don't know, maybe you guys are too young to remember, it was some years back. Uh, in Waco, Texas, the Branch Davidians, David Koresh, and how the FBI stormed us in. There were some Anabaptists who were very much like that. Uh, or this other thing in Texas that just got raided, this polygamous sect, you know. There were some Anabaptists who were a lot like that. But then there were other groups that, like I say, were um, some of the most godly people that ever walked the face of the earth. You see, basically, the Anabaptist label got applied to anybody who was outside the official church. And some of those outside the official church were wackos. Some of them, a good number of them, perhaps for a majority of them, were very godly people who just wanted to do their thing without the interference of the state. Well, again, some of these radical reformers wanted to change society for the good, for the benefit of the common man, and one of the remarkable events in the wake of Luther's work was the Peasants' War. It was led in large measure by a guy named Thomas Munzer. Munzer was a priest and a former follower of Luther who became a leader of the peasant uprisings in central Germany in 1525, which already had flared up a year earlier. The peasants called upon Luther's teachings and demanded more just economical conditions, even if that meant the downfall of the authorities in those structures. Now, Luther condemned these peasants who wanted a social rebellion in his preaching. And it was a huge disappointment to the peasants who expected his support. In Luther's mind, he was only encouraging them to free themselves from spiritual despots, not from their economic or political influence. And so when the peasants were angry with Luther, Luther got angry right back and he wrote a highly charged work uh, titled Against the Murderous and Thieving Hordes of the Peasants. Some historians estimate that up to 300,000 peasants were involved in this open rebellion and that 100,000 were killed. This has been called the last great medieval peasant revolt and the first modern revolution. And the peasants were defeated on May 15th at the Battle of Frankenhausen. Now, when Luther defended the aristocracy, the ruling nobles in the peasant rebellion, Anabaptist leaders felt incredibly betrayed by Martin Luther and by Zwingli for that matter. Now, in all of this, what's very fascinating is that it seems that Luther and Zwingli <coughs> seemed to retreat from previous positions that they had held. In other words, at one time, Luther and Zwingli were more radical than they later were. So the Anabaptists began 
as breakoffs from the most prominent reformers. And the Anabaptists did not mind being known as breakoffs from the most radical or from the from the standard reformers. This drove Luther and Calvin crazy because what Luther and Calvin wanted to emphasize was that Rome kicked them out. Luther and Calvin wanted to emphasize the idea, we didn't leave Rome, they kicked us out. But the Anabaptists, they didn't care. They said, yeah, we left Rome, it's corrupt, we should leave it. The Anabaptists repudiated ties between the church and the state, and they considered the church to be a voluntary association of committed believers. And it's for these very reasons that the Anabaptists were not a monolithic movement. They were made up of many various factions and groups, and it's almost misleading to put them under one title, uh, Anabaptists or, or uh, Radical Reformers. Luther denounced them as being Schraumer, that is, enthusiasts or fanatics. While the Anabaptists did get extreme in many places, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a future lecture, it's wrong to think that they were out of step with apostolic Christianity. You see, they were terribly persecuted on all sides, both from other Protestants and from the Roman Catholics. And they called in, this was because they called into question the whole relationship between church and state in the Christian society. But the Anabaptists often showed remarkable courage in their persecutions. Here's the, from the writings of Menno Simmons, an Anabaptist leader. However lamentably we may here be persecuted, oppressed, smitten, robbed, burned at the stake, drowned in the water by hellish Pharaoh and his cruel, unmerciful servants, yet soon shall come the day of our refreshing, and all the tears shall be wiped from our eyes, and we shall be arrayed in the white silken robes of righteousness. Follow the Lamb, and with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob sit down in the kingdom of God, and possess the precious, pleasant land of eternal and perishable joy." Praise God and lift up your heads, ye who suffer for Jesus' sake. The time is near when you shall hear, Come ye blessed, and you shall rejoice with him forevermore. These godly among the Anabaptists face their persecutions with a remarkable courage and strength. Generally, we can say that the Anabaptists took the principles that Luther and later Calvin emphasized. Justification by faith alone the authority of the scriptures, but they just took things farther than Luther or Calvin thought they should. And one of the great reasons why I think Luther didn't follow along in those lines that he had set in motion, because I believe he was afraid of losing political support. Luther was very conscious that he was protected by the civil authorities, by Frederick the Wise and his brother John after him, he was very conscious of this. And Luther thought, I believe, that if I get too extreme, I'm going to lose my political support. But again, I want you to realize how much we owe to these Anabaptists. When you say that you believe in believer's baptism, when you believe in a believer's church and not a state church, when you say that the state should have no control over religious matters, you are saying things that were radical propositions back in the days of the Reformers. Now, Luther had his problems with those who wanted to take the reforming principles further than he intended. But technically, you could say that the Anabaptist movement began in Switzerland in the church of Ulrich Zwingli. In 1519, Zwingli became the pastor or the people's priest at the great Minster of Zurich, and he began teaching verse by verse straight through the New Testament. In 1519 through 1523, Zwingli teaches and reforms were gradually introduced, but if you remember what I said in a previous lecture, in October of 1523, Zwingli introduced certain reforms that he wanted to make to the Mass and changes that he wanted to do, and what did the city council say? No. And what did Zwingli say when the city council said no? He said, okay, we won't do that. This really bothered some people in Zwingli's church. Because for some crazy reason, there were some people in Zwingli's church who started thinking that what the Bible said was more important than what the government or particular religious leaders said. 
And this was the basic root of the Anabaptist belief that the state should not be the judge or the police of true faith on the earth. And so for these believers, the first great issue was adult baptism. A dissenting group in Zurich, led by a God man named Conrad Grebel, wanted to make adult baptism in general practice among Swiss Reformation believers. Because he said the Bible nowhere supports the idea of infant baptism. The city council of Zurich became aware of their concerns and they debated the issue, but the city council on January 21st, 1525 said, you're wrong and you can't practice adult baptism. Infant baptism is the way that we do it. But again, the believers who wanted to do this, like Conrad Grable, he said, listen, this is just a case of political powers trying to rule our spiritual life. And therefore, on that snowy evening in January, in a nearby village, they met and baptized one another. Later, they would take on the name Anabaptist, or be assigned that name, because they didn't call themselves Anabaptists. The first baptism was performed by Conrad Grable to a man named George Blaurock in the home of a man named Felix Mons. In many ways, I want you to see, this all was a tribute to Zwingli's influence on these men, was it not? Zwingli was the man who taught these men, believe the Bible, trust in the Bible, look to the Bible. But when they did, and tried to live it out, they got in trouble. It's interesting, this man, Grable, was a, a fine man, he came from a fine family, well-educated, studied at the University of Vienna, he made eloquent and educated arguments against the practice of infant baptism. They just wanted to revive a very simple and orderly apostolic church. They believed in a church where you would come and belong to it because you wanted to, because you were a believer. That They believed in a church where you could remove the faithless or immoral people following the injunctions of Matthew 18. They tried to have an order of worship that was not so liturgical, but just would simply do what the Bible said. Well, when they started doing this, when they started baptizing, Zwingli was amazed and he was distressed. He attacked these Anabaptists with great strength and he uh, published works condemning them and their uh, works. For example, uh, this is the title page of How Unity and Peace Are Attained, which was a pamphlet by Zwingli attacking the radicals and the Anabaptists from Zurich in 1524. Grable died of the plague in 1526. Mans was executed by drowning, a favorite method of executing the Anabaptists. You understand that? <laughs> Basically, they would say to these Anabaptists, they would say, well, you love to go under the water, don't you? You love to be baptized. Well, we'll baptize you. And they would basically drown them. It was a very common way of executing Anabaptists. So Grable died of the plague, Mons was executed by drowning, Blaurock escaped to Austria and was arrested and burned at the stake in 1529. Another very popular leader of the early Anabaptist movement was a Swabian man named Baltazar, Baltazar Hubemeyer. He shocked his congregation in the year 1525 by proclaiming that he now rejected infant baptism and on Easter Sunday he was had himself baptized as an adult together with most of the members of his congregation. He became a traveling preacher who preached his message all over southern Germany and he was captured March 10, 1528, burned at the stake while his wife was executed by drowning. So again, I just want you to get a feeling of how they treated these people who simply wanted to be followers and believers of Jesus Christ without interference from the state. But, through the work of this man Hubmeier and others in southern Germany, there arose an amazing movement. Um, sometimes people look at the Reformation and talk about it in terms of being a revival. And we're going to spend an entire lecture taking a look at the phenomenon of revival. But what I want you to grab a hold of is the idea. I don't believe that the Reformation was really a revival in the same sense of some of the later 
great awakenings and revivals that history saw. Because actually the evidence shows that Martin Luther himself was very discouraged by the fact that his ideas did not penetrate and seem to hit the common man as much as he had hoped. He had hoped that there would be a revival, but instead the Reformation can rightly be called much more a reforming of um, theology and of church practice, but not a true popular revival. But I believe that there was revival during the days of the Reformation. It's just that that revival happened among the Anabaptists. Because their teaching, their heart, their passion for the Lord spread like wildfire. I told you about this guy named Hubmeier, who started spreading his doctrine, his teaching, his gospel all around southern Germany until he was caught and captured and killed in 1528. Well, in Schwabia, that is this area of southern Germany, special police called Baptist hunters, Taufriere, were appointed to apprehend Anabaptists and kill them on the spot. There were so many Anna, An Anabaptists that they had to appoint 400 of these special police across southern Germany. But soon 400 weren't enough. And they raised the number of these special Baptist hunters to be a thousand people dedicated to hunting them down. In the year 1529, the Imperial Diet of Speyer placed these dissenters under the ancient law against heretics, and they said every Anabaptist and rebaptized person of either sex should be put to death by fire, sword, or some other way. This is how great a threat they saw it to their. Um, state church institutions. One contemporary observer named Sebastian Frank uh, described what took place. He said that the Anabaptists spread so rapidly that their teaching soon covered as it were the land. They soon gained a large following and baptized many thousands, drawing themselves many sincere souls who had a zeal for God, for they taught nothing but love, faith, and the cross. Later on, he says, some have estimated the number of those who were killed to be at above 2,000. They died as martyrs, patiently and humbly endured all persecutions. There were thousands and thousands of people who became followers of Anabaptist sects or Anabaptist movements. Now you have to understand too, one other reason why that the European world saw these Anabaptists as being such a threat. It did not only have to do with um, the fact that they were outside the state church and didn't want to be regulated by the state, but it was also a time when Muslim Turks were threatening Europe and most Anabaptists preached pacifism. <coughs> the ruling authorities saw that as a real threat, and this was another reason why they were persecuted. Now, the Anabaptists, as I said before, had some among them who were the absolute, some of the godliest people ever to walk the face of the earth. But they also had among them some very bizarre people. And some of the bizarre people we're going to talk about right now. Um, the Anabaptists were often, as an entire group, condemned as being bizarre, perverted heretics. And the anti Anabaptist literature loved to paint them as being crazy and immoral. Uh, in this picture up on the PowerPoint right now, you see the description of the several sorts of Anabaptists together with their mode of rebaptizing. And this was a book or a pamphlet published in the 16th century condemning the Anabaptists and trying to give people the idea. Uh, that the Anabaptists were all heretical and crazy. And you see around the perimeter, around the border of this thing, several different groups with different titles. And these were thought to be the many different kinds of Anabaptists and their different modes of craziness. Well, the fact is, is that there were many different kinds of Anabaptists, right? It was a very broad term used to talk about anybody who was outside of the institutional church. But what we also find from this is that some of these groups were crazy. There's no doubt about it. 
But what the enemies of the Anabaptists did was merely emphasize the craziest of the groups. So you see here a devil up at the top vomiting out upon the Anabaptists who are down there in the river doing the practice of baptism. And then you also see how they show on the lower part of it, the people who are being baptized, the idea there is that there's something immoral, right? They're kind of naked in the water, and this is what they're trying to show, is that this is just a big immorality thing. As if the whole reason that they were baptizing people was because they just wanted to go skinny dipping or something like that. Um, this idea, again, was emphasized in other literatures. That this is a meeting of the Anabaptists, basically showing them to be oh, just a bunch of nudists who gathered together, and as if that was the whole idea behind the Anabaptism. Well, again, truthfully, the Anabaptist movement was like a great big tree, and there were some bizarre branches on the tree. Some of the Anabaptists were very contentious. They would go into a state church, right? Maybe it was a state Lutheran church, maybe it was a state Catholic church, but they would go into a state church and start interrupting the sermons. They would be loud, they would be contentious. Some of them practiced polygamy. Now some of them were weird, but harmless. A good example of this is a man named Melchior Hoffman. Hoffman was a self-taught Lutheran preacher who was first heard of in Scandinavia and northern Germany. He started Laut Lutheran, but then he switched to a more Zwinglian position and then ended up as an Anabaptist. He was converted and baptized, and he preached a strong message of the soon return of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, Hoffman was forced to leave Strasbourg and then northern Germany and then, excuse me, and then northern Germany, and then he went on to the Netherlands. He gathered some extremist followers around him when he was in Holland. And they convinced him that the new Jerusalem would be established in Strasbourg, and that he was a second Elijah called to prophesy, called to prophesy and announced a great event. However, these prophets convinced him, you would first have to be imprisoned for six months to bring this about. So what did Hoffman do? Well, he rushed back from Holland all the way down to Strasbourg, and he told the city officials, hey, um, there's a new Jerusalem coming to Strasbourg. These are the prophecies that have been given forth, but in order for these uh, prophecies to be, uh, for them to come to pass, I have to be imprisoned for six months. And the authorities said, you want us to put you in jail for six months? We're more than happy to do it. And so they put him into jail, although he languished in that jail for 10 years. The little food that he got was lowered to him through a hole in the ceiling, and he died still convinced that the millennium was coming very soon. Now, Melchior Hoffman was strange, but he was definitely not violent. He did not feel that it was his place to make the kingdom of God come by force. As well, he was not alone in his expectation of the soon return of Jesus. It was very commonly and passionately believed around the time of the Reformation that Jesus was coming back soon. In the year 1521, Luther believed that the end of the world would come no later than 1524. So he rushed his publication of the translation in the, into German of the book of Daniel ahead of the rest of the New Testament so everybody could understand the prophecies that the end was near. But it didn't happen in Luther's day. It didn't happen in Melchior Hoffman's day. But after Melchior Hoffman, there were followers of, followers of him called the Melchiorites. And a man named John Matthews was a baker in Harlem in the Netherlands, and he decided to continue Hoffman's work. Hoffman's work. He decided to send out apostles of his, two by two, to tell that the end of the age was coming. And he ended up becoming a very violent example of this Anabaptist movement. We're going to take a break here. We'll consider what happened to uh, John Matthews when we come back from the break, and what happened on other spheres in the aftermath of the... Um, the uh, Reformation. Anyway.